I'd, I'd like us to pause. Uh, as, as you may know, uh, lives were lost in the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And as we advance uh, our work on intentionally integrating arts, culture, and design into all facets of society, let's not forget the workers of all kinds who make that possible. And for them, please, a moment of silence. Thank you. For the record, joining us in person are Ishmael Ahmed of Michigan, Bitta Becker of Navajo Nation, Bruce Carter of Florida, Gretchen Gonzalez Davidson of Michigan, Maria De Leon of Texas, Christopher Morgan of California, Fiona Whelan Prine of Tennessee, Connie Williams of Pennsylvania, and joining us virtually are Keenan Azme of New York. Michael Lombardo of California, Jake Shimabukuro of Hawaii, Waskar Medina of Kansas, Emil Kang of New York, Paul Hodes of Maine, Aaron Dworkin of Michigan, Camila Forbes of New York. Absent today are Deepa Gupta of Illinois and Rani Ramaswamy of Minnesota. Established by Congress in 1965, the National Endowment for the Arts is an independent federal agency charged with making the arts available to all Americans. By advancing equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice, the NEA fosters and sustains an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the United States. We're a funder, a grant maker, and also a national resource, a convener, connector, catalyst. We bolster arts, design, and culture in all communities. The National Council on the Arts advises on agency policies, programs, and grants. For our first order of business, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the October 2023 Council meeting? Thank you. Second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Now, please welcome Ayana Hudson, Chief Strategy, Programs, and Engagement Officer at the NEA. Good morning. I'm an African-American woman with long dark hair. I'm wearing glasses, red lipstick, and a black and blue suit. Good morning, council members. We will proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting by ballot today on award recommendations, totaling more than $115 million in three funding areas. Grants for arts projects, state and regional partnerships, and national initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of the council book. For your vote to be tallied, you must be either present in the room on the telephone line or join the meeting via video conference at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members join us by phone or via teleconference. You must email your votes to Kim Jefferson in this category immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded in the council book and will be attached to your ballots and each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under grants for arts projects, state and regional partnerships, and national initiatives in the council book? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Now I will summarize the funding areas on which you will be voting and then pause for any comments or questions from council members. The grants for arts projects or GAP categories, the principal grants program of the National Endowment for the Arts. Through project-based funding, the program supports opportunities for public engagement with the arts and arts education, for the integration of the arts with strategies promoting the health and well-being of people and communities, and for the improvement of the overall capacity and capabilities within the arts sector. GAP encourages projects that use the arts to unite and heal in response to current events, as well as 
elevate artists as integral and essential to a healthy and vibrant society, celebrate America's creativity and our cultural heritage, and facilitate cross-sector collaborations that center the arts at the intersection of other disciplines, sectors, and industries. Projects recommended today comprise the second group of GAP applications brought to the Council this fiscal year. The first half was considered at the October 2023 meeting. In July 2023, the agency received 2,129 eligible applications requesting nearly $111,700,000 in FY24 support. Recommended for the Council's approval are 1,142 projects, totally more than $37,700,000. Grants are recommended to 54% of all applicants, with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $150,000. Recommended projects span 13 disciplines and fields. Direct grants are recommended to 48 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Please mark your ballot. State and regional partnerships assist the nation's state arts agencies and regional arts organizations in their support for the arts. By law, 40% of arts endowment appropriated program funds are awarded in this way. State arts agencies will utilize NEA support in combination with state appropriated funding to support arts organizations, schools, and artists and producing arts projects in communities all across the country. This year, more than $55 million is being recommended for the states and $11,700,000 for the regions. Please mark your ballot. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and fieldwide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for projects totaling more than $9,300,000. Support is requested for an arts education initiative, the Arts Education Partnership, or AEP. The AEP demonstrates and promotes the essential role of the arts in enabling every student to succeed in school and prepare for life and work in the 21st century. The Creative Placemaking Technical Assistance Initiative, which provides assistance in executing creative placemaking projects in rural, tribal, suburban, and urban communities to grantees of and prospective applicants to our town program and to the larger creative placemaking field. The production and management of public events for the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship Program, which annually honors American folk and traditional artists or groups of artists for their contribution to our national cultural mosaic. Three projects and international activities. The Performing Arts Global Exchange, a program designed to provide broader access to the work of international artists and art forms less frequently seen outside of major urban centers in the United States. The Performing Arts Discovery Program, an initiative to introduce international presenters to U.S. performing artists and companies, thereby reducing barriers for American artists to perform overseas. And U.S. Artists International, a program showcasing the excellence, diversity, and vitality of U.S. artists and arts organizations in international arts markets and other significant cultural events around the world. The Renewal of Poetry Out Loud, Another of the agency's signature national initiatives in literary arts, the NEA Big Read. The Independent Film and Media Arts Initiative, which will focus on knowledge and exchange and peer learning, with an emphasis on regional networks, equity, and career sustainability for individuals working in the film and media arts industry. A cooperative agreement to support the production and management of the NEA Jazz Master Ceremony and Tribute Concert which honors the National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Masters Fellows, the 2025 class of NEA Jazz Masters Fellows, the Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge for high school students, 68 recommendations in our town, which will help transform American communities into lively, beautiful, and resilient places with the arts at their core. The renewal of 11 National Endowment for the Arts Research Labs, which will focus on the arts, creativity, cognition, and learning, as well as the arts, health, and social emotional well-being, and the renewal of the Sound Health Network Initiative, which will regularly convene experts in music, 
neuroscience, health, and wellness, and will identify and promote research findings. And Shakespeare and American communities in which professional theater companies will bring performances and educational activities to middle and high school students, as well as support apprenticeships for early and mid-career theater administrators and technicians across the country. Please mark your ballot. Council members joining remotely, you may now email your votes to Kim Jefferson on those categories. And finally, we turn our attention to the projects in the award update section. These grants have been awarded under the chairman's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are 255 Challenge America grants, totaling $2,550,000, which will extend the reach of the visual, performing, and literary arts activities in underserved communities across the country, three 20% amendments, and one Chair's Extraordinary Action Grant. Thank you all. Thank you, Ayana. I'll take the next few minutes to share some updates and insights since our last council meeting in October. It was a busy and productive winter for all of us at the Arts Endowment. In the past few months, I've had an opportunity to travel with NEA staff to urban and rural communities, announced over $32 million of grant awards, launched Arts Here to support arts ecosystems serving underserved populations, and with the Domestic Policy Council at the White House, held a national convening on the role of arts and culture in building healthy communities. In early November, the NEA traveled with our colleagues at the National Endowment for the Humanities to Mississippi. Our trip included several extraordinary experiences that underscored how essential the arts and humanities are in rural and urban places. In Utica, we visited the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, or SIP Culture, and learned about a community revitalization strategy anchored in honoring the history of a place, advancing the work of artists, and reconnecting to the town's agrarian roots. Throughout our visit in the Jackson area, we witnessed the power and legacy of historically black colleges and universities, including Jackson State University, Tougaloo College, and Hines Community College. NEH Chair Shelley Lowe and I spoke at the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival at Jackson State University, discussing the power of the arts and humanities in providing information to, and also providing information to the audience about the work of our agencies. The festival was a historic and inspiring event, celebrating black women writers across the generations and their contributions as stewards and makers of our history, heritage, and our humanity. In January, I participated at the Sphinx Connect convening in Detroit, Michigan, joining National Council on the Arts member Aaron Dworkin in conversation about living artful lives, the power of the arts in expressing our full humanity and uplifting our communities, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in arts leadership. In addition to the Sphinx Connect convening, I visited New York in January, delivering a keynote address at the Chamber Music America National Conference. I spoke on the role of music in promoting well-being and the vital role that chamber musicians and ensembles play in the arts landscape, and the ways in which the NEA is showing up as a national resource to support arts ecosystems for the performing arts sector. Earlier this month, I delivered a keynote address at the Wisconsin Governor's Conference on Tourism, speaking on cultural tourism and celebrating the Wisconsin Arts Board's 50th anniversary. On this trip, I also discussed access to arts experiences and arts integration strategies with Beth Haskovec, Director of the Wisconsin Office of Rural Prosperity. I was also in conversation with 2020 NEA Heritage Fellow, Karen Ann Hoffman, about the profound contributions of Native American and indigenous artists and the systems of support they rely on and need for their work. 
On January 30th, the NEA and White House co-hosted Healing, Bridging, Thriving, a summit on arts and culture in our communities. It was a first of its kind gathering, bringing together local and state leaders, artists and arts workers, philanthropy, and federal officials in many different policy areas to highlight the role of arts and culture in creating healthy communities where all people can thrive. The summit was inspired by President Biden's executive order to integrate arts and humanities into policies and strategies that create opportunity and equity. And the summit built upon foundational work that was decades in the making at the intersection of areas of policy and practice uh, that span the spectrum. Federal leaders, including the U.S. Surgeon General, agency leaders, and the second gentleman, joined the NEA and the White House Domestic Policy Council to lift up the importance of thoughtful and intentional arts integration across the policy spectrum. Let's take a few minutes to watch some highlights from the summit. There's a quote from Toni Morrison that I find very inspirational. She said, as you enter positions of trust and power, dream a little before you think. I challenge us to take a moment to dream, to suspend what we're used to, what's standard, what's typical, and to stand in the space of possibility. What if we included arts and humanities in all policies and programs intended to help us deliver on the promise of our nation? What if we thought of health and healing more holistically? What if we better enabled and compensated artists, culture bearers, and cultural organizations for contributing to health and healing at a national scale? What if we fully recognize the ways our physical environments influence our civic life and our social fabric, and we fully recognize the power of art and design in those realms? And what if we could find modes of expression in our daily lives that unite us instead of divide us, experiences that allow us to see one another's full humanity, experiences that make visible our commonalities and our meaningful differences, and experiences that fuel a healthy democracy? And that is really what is so vital in this time, the understanding we have of people's lives, the emotional connection the arts creates to make us see people who are very different from ourselves. And honestly, that is central to democracy. Because in a democracy, we really must be able to see the human dignity of all Americans. Private philanthropy plays a vital role in supporting arts and culture in communities around the country. Yet for all of the resources that we are able to invest, it's our ability to have meaningful and sustained partnerships with the public sector that ultimately enables enduring change. That's why this historic and cross-sectoral event is so important in these times, and it's why the theme of arts integration is so central to our success. It positions the arts as fundamental, essential, and inescapable. The arts are just as important as the sciences. They're an important part of the human experience. They tell our story and help us process emotions and help us access imagination and inspiration in very different ways than science does. And we need both of those uh, to really and truly uh, lift people up and to benefit humanity. So, this is a time where I, I do think revitalizing the arts is essential for not only fostering social connection, but for bringing hope uh, to people at a time where a lot of people are worried about the future and they feel taxed by everything they have gone through uh, in, in the past. We made important strides in expanding the narrative around the value of the arts and culture in our society, expanding from our default economic impacts to include contributions to health and healing, a robust democracy, and to getting us unstuck and on our way to solutions that help our nation deliver on its promise. We also affirmed the important role of artists and creative workers in all aspects of society, 
and we stepped out in a prominent way as a national resource able to convene, connect, catalyze, amplify, and lead. In the short window of time since the summit, the NEA has been working hard to continue animating the integration of the arts across all areas of policy and practice. And good effort has gone into strengthening our relationships across the government. Here are a few examples. On January, in, in January, I spoke on a panel with the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra and Department of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack and award-winning chef Sean Sherman, a member of the Oglala Lakota Sioux tribe, at an event titled Food is Medicine. Our discussion focused on the role of food in promoting health and the ways food and culture foster belonging, deepen identity, and connect us with one another through the rituals encompassing how we prepare it and with whom we consume it, all important components that contribute to our health and well-being. In February, I joined Acting Secretary Sue at the Department of Labor, speaking to an audience of artists and arts professionals, union representatives, and students from HBCUs on the importance of supporting pathways to good paying jobs in the arts and promoting a diverse workforce in the cultural sector. I also joined the White House Office of Public Engagement for a fireside chat with actress Gina Torres and media personality Sunny Hostin. The event celebrated the diversity and artistic contributions of Afro-Latinos in media, music, television, and film, and addressed aspirations for a more diverse and inclusive cultural sector. I spoke to more than 500 FEMA employees from across the country and addressed the ways in which our two agencies can continue to help bring the power of the arts and artists to bear before, during, and after disasters. In addition to this, I'm pleased to see FEMA taking action to better support artists as survivors of disasters through reforms in their individual assistance programs. In February, the NEA kicked off the first meeting of the Interagency Working Group on Arts, Health, and Civic Infrastructure, co-chaired by Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Becerra and me. 20 individuals joined representing diverse agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Transportation, National Science Foundation, AmeriCorps, and more. This month, the NEA released a podcast between, between U.S. Census Director Rob Santos and me, where we elevate and appreciate the myriad ways the social sciences and arts and culture can converge in beneficial ways. Director Santos, an artist himself, noted how the arts make him a better social scientist and how they can be a critical force enabling government to better serve the public. The summit and the work that follows represents a watershed moment for the art sector. It builds on a foundational body of work that has been created with immense potential and possibility for the integration of the arts in every sector. In this moment of opportunity, we recognize, however, that despite the additional support of $210 million made available to the field through the American Rescue Plan and the CARES Act, there's still more work to do. Research released this week by the NEA and the Bureau of Economic Analysis shows that overall the arts sector is a $1.1 trillion industry that helps support 5.2 million jobs. However, certain parts of the cultural sector, especially the performing arts sector, are struggling. To introduce our panels discussing the state of the arts performing, it's the state of the performing arts sector and provide some framing remarks, please join me in welcoming National Council on the Arts member, Camilla Forbes. Good morning. I'm, I'm pleased to help introduce the pro, today's program, Meeting the Moment, Building a Healthy Performing Arts Ecosystem. And on behalf of my fellow National Council on the Arts members, I want to thank all of you all for being here today and for the work you do every day to bring the arts to American communities. And I especially want to thank the panelists who've traveled far and wide to participate in this important conversation. Now, all of us in the room attending this meeting virtually and in person were part of the cultural arts sector, artists, administrators, practitioners, partners, funders, know that all of the arts are central and fundamental in our individual lives and our national life. But we also know that in 2024, our field is on, on the surface is at a moment of changing and unsettling tides. 
As we recover from a global pandemic, audience have not returned to pre-pandemic numbers, causing our economic models to tilt on its axis. Philanthropy directed to the arts is currently um, on, a, on a slight decline. Competition for cultural attention via technology streaming is also on an incline. There's, there is um, a, a forced struggle on the ideas and in books um, and ideas uh, being banned in states across the country. Now, this may seem as a bleak outlook as if our industry and field is standing on a bed of sinking sand. But I want to, but join me here to sit in a moment of remembrance and reflection. A century ago, our globe was also on the tail end of a, of a global health pandemic. A century ago, the Black Lash, the, the Black Lash Reconstruction was some of the most restrictive legislation in the form of Jim Crow laws, redlining legislation, was also present. But also a century ago, against this backdrop, birthed cultural revolutions as we've never seen them before. One of those was the Harlem Renaissance. The genius of Elaine Locke and W.B. Du Bois created, curated one of the greatest foundations of beauty, art, and narrative building. And what we learn from this period in time is that cultural revolutions are curated. They are conjured, believed, debated, and doubted. It is established and elusive. So with that in mind, the National Endowment on the Arts is engaged in a deep listening to the field practitioners and thought partners and is committed to serving as a driving force in addressing the challenges and opportunities of this moment. There will be more work on this area in the coming months, but we wanted to dedicate time in our meeting to delve into this critical issue and begin to look forward to positive steps that we can take in improving the health and vibrancy of this most valued sector. Building on the agency's recent convening, Health Healing, Bridging, Thriving, a Summit on the Arts and Culture in Our Communities, the panels this morning are part of the agency's work to build and sustain efforts to strengthen the arts and cultural ecosystems across the country, including theater, dance, music, and opera fields. And today's program will feature two panel discussions on the state of the nonprofit performing arts sector. We've assembled an esteemed group of speakers and presenters who graciously agree to share their insights and perspectives on the performing arts. NEA Theater and Musical Theater director uh, Greg Reiner will moderate the first panel, How Did We Get Here? And the panelists will explore the challenges uh, that companies and cultural venues and performing arts organizations face, as well as examples of strategies that have emerged to help organizations navigate for the current environment and better connect with their communities. And following the first panel, producing playwright and citizen artist Annalisa Diaz will share a reading. NEA dance director Sarah Nash will moderate the second panel, Where Do We Go From Here? Panelists will share their ideas around the future of live performance in America, how to strengthen the ecosystem for the performing arts, and how they can contribute to our lives and communities in many different ways. Following the two panel discussions, there will be a short Q&A session between panelists and council members. And with that, I'm happy to invite NEA's Director of Theater and Musical Theater, Greg Reiner, up to the stage, as well as the members of our first panel, How Did We Get Here? Thank you, and please enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Camilla. It's such an honor to be introduced by you. I'm sorry we can't be uh, together in person. Um, and welcome all, and thank you all for being here today. Um, as Camilla said, you know, one of my questions is why are we here? Why are we having these conversations and engaging in this deep work? It's because of, as Camilla mentioned, this, re this renaissance of 100 years ago, if you've had the privilege of attending a live performance in the last year, you'll know that that kind of energy, that kind of creative force is very much alive and well in, in our nation as we speak. And so that's why we're putting all this effort into sustaining and building up the field because the work is so valuable, so important. The idea of live performing arts where we can be in a room together, having a communal experience, not just sitting at home alone, um, is so, so important. It echoes some of what the Surgeon General said about the loneliness epidemic and how the arts are really a solution to that. So I'm so honored to be with all of you today. I'm gonna to say I also wanna recognize my colleagues here who have put this program together, Sarah Nash, our Director of Dance, who you'll be hearing from soon, and Ann Meyer Baker, our Director of Music and Opera. And I really appreciate their leadership and collaboration on this program today. Um, so the goal of the conversation today is to explore the challenges that companies, cultural venues, and performing arts organizations face, some of which predate the pandemic, which we'll talk about, and look at some strategies that have emerged to help organizations navigate the current environment and better connect with their communities. Um, so our panel today, They've traveled far and wide to be with us. Thank you, uh, and I'm gonna introduce them. 
Now, first we'll start with Annie Burridge, who's the general director uh, and CEO of Austin Opera. Uh, Kelvin Dinkins Jr., executive director of American Repertory Theater. Carrie Lee, the co-artistic director of Atlanta Chinese Dance Company. And Laura Penn, the executive director of the Society of Stage Directors and Choreographers, as well as a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. So let's get right to our conversation, because we don't have that much time. We've got a lot of important stuff to talk about. So my first question I'll throw open to the group is, um, how is, is um, sorry, I was looking at the second panel here for a second. What were the existing structural challenges facing the field prior to the pandemic? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I, I'm gonna read something, if that's okay, and I, I promise I'll be brief. But um, whatever the balance of the decade holds, our assumption about the role of the arts in a complex and contradictory scheme of American life has begun to unravel. And our assumptions about the strength, endurance, and resilience of our arts institutions has been challenged by hard economic realities. We are caught in a crossfire of circumstance brought on by design and neglect. While we ultimately view this period in light of many economic, social, environmental, and political events, the situation for the arts uh, is defined by crisis. I, I want to echo Camilla's um, comment uh, about actually being very optimistic. I know that sounds um, not so good, but I also believe in, in, in history and in understanding what has come before so that we can both know the ground on which we stand, but also so we can thank people who helped us get to the position that we are in. This report was published in 1991 by FedApp, which was a federal agency that was looking at how to help uh, grow and sustain the nonprofit theater sector. So I think that's an important thing for us to just sit with for a moment and to realize that that was published at the same time that we were um, uh, beginning to enter the culture wars of the 90s, which I s suspect everybody in this room has some sense of uh, what that meant for the field. Uh, that was also the moment that we were entering the first um, attempt at diversifying the field, multiculturalism as it was referred to at the time because uh, the field had been the purview for too long of a singular demographic. Uh, we made it through the 90s, but the cost was the loss of operational support, sustaining support to the arts uh, community. We then hit 9-11, we hit the dot-com bust, you know, we had the mortgage crisis, the financial crisis, we then went to Me Too, we then hit COVID, the murder of George Floyd, all the while, uh, the distribution of wealth was growing um, so dramatically in this country. So I, I think there is much um, to celebrate in the moment, and there is a lot of work to do, and um, I think the pandemic uh, laid bare um, much of what we'd been struggling with for a very long time. I can speak generally and specifically to opera and opera in Austin. I would say uh, pre-pandemic, most of my colleagues um, working in opera, every organization had some kind of structural gap in their budget that we had to solve for every year um, through some extraordinary act of philanthropy or some genius act of cost savings, whatever it was. Um, and so that, that was challenging um, as we were emerging from COVID. Um, all of those gaps had at least doubled um, for all of our colleagues as expenses have increased. So, you know, in opera, we um, uniquely, we, we are the most extraordinarily expensive <laughs> undertaking on the planet sometimes, I think, um, just because of the sheer number of artistic personnel, right? We've got an orchestra of 60, a chorus of 40, a crew of more than 50, eight to 10 principals, a conductor, a stage director, designers. So it's a huge undertaking in terms of very talented personnel. So we've always been like the most reliant art form, I would say, on philanthropy. Um, and also unique about Austin, Texas um, and about producing an art form that is that vast in Austin, Texas, is we have virtually no institutional support. So I was with Opera Philadelphia for nine years before moving to Austin. 
in Philadelphia, I could raise three to five million dollars in um, foundation grants every year. Um, I moved to take the post in Austin in 2016, and that year they raised ten thousand dollars in foundation funding. There are no um, foundations or major entities in Austin that are supporting the arts, so most of the cultural organizations there are about half the size that we should be for a market of our size and a market that has grown so rapidly. Um, and I'll just say, post-pandemic, those two um, the challenges have grown triple-fold, right? Um, we were able to competitively win some national grants each year to get that number from 10,000 to about 200 to 300,000. And we had a $200,000 grant from our city every year funded by the hotel and occupancy tax. Um, all that money is gone now. Um, the city has zeroed out the large cultural institutions. Um, national foundations have shifting priorities. Um, as we've discussed, and my expenses are up 30 to 40 percent. So I'm down 10 percent in revenue from the sources I just cited. My expenses are 30 to 40 percent higher, mostly driven by increased personnel costs, travel and housing for incoming artists. Thank you. Gary. Thank you so much to the NEA for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's truly an honor, especially because Chinese dance is an art form that has historically been marginalized in the US. And um, so this topic has been written about in an essay by a leading scholar of Chinese dance studies, Dr. Emily E. Wilcox. And she talks about how Chinese dance is uh, often perceived to be only relevant to the Chinese community, whereas Western art forms like um, ballet and modern dance are perceived to be universal and required to be studied and understood by everyone. Um, and so this has led to uh, most of the dance world lacking basic knowledge about Chinese dance. So um, Laura mentioned multiculturalism in the 90s, but as late as 2016, like uh, leading uh, Chinese dance drama touring from China came to New York and it was trashed by a New York Times critic because he didn't really understand how to appreciate Chinese dance. Um, and so like many other marginalized dance forms, Chinese dance has been excluded from resources and attention afforded to those in the center. Um, so my mother, Hui Ying Li, founded the Atlanta Chinese Dance Company in 1991, and we co-direct the company together. And between the two of us, we do most of the artistic and administrative tasks for the company, so it's, uh, we're stretched pretty thin. And uh, recently, I, work, I choreographed for a professional theater company, and I realized that I was doing like six people's jobs. <laughs> so <laughs> that's probably not surprising to anyone who's run a small organization. Um, <laughs> But um, I was born and raised in Atlanta, which is in the American South, and I think most people think of that as a black-white racial binary. Um, so for me, it actually took a long time to uh, unlearn this internalized racism that I grew up with, that uh, basically I thought uh, uh, only a white person can be a real American, and that my Chinese heritage is backwards. And so for a long time, I actually looked down on Chinese dance as inferior to ballet, which I also studied at Atlanta Ballet. I didn't understand as a kid, like the vast uh, discrepancy in resources. So for our organization, where our budget size is like under $100,000, for Atlanta Ballet, it's like multi-million dollars. And also like systemic issues like cultural hegemony. Um, so I thought it was Chinese dance that was the problem. So I just really hope that uh, we can all recognize that Asian Americans are part of the American story, and so Chinese dance is also part of the American dance ecosystem. Um, so my colleagues have put it very well. Greg, and to your original question about what we were facing prior to the pandemic, um, there's no secret that we had a sustainability crisis from the get-go. You know, we formalized, we professionalized as an industry, we've built up um, these institutions, these edifices, we've, we've professionalized in a way that is just going to scale year after year. We, our, our artists now have unions, right? We are all fighting for equitable conditions in which we can produce and create art. And so with that comes a cost. Um, th there's never advocacy for less money, right? We will always have more of a need. And so we are on an incline that has just been exacerbated by the past four years to actually focus in um, on the fact that there are a lot of professional companies. You know, the regional theater movement is only close to, you know, 60 plus years, right? We are still developing as an industry and when we, as we seek greater resources, as we continue to advocate, um, as Chair Jackson has already illuminated, there are things we have to pivot to start doing now as businesses because I think we were set up to fail from the get-go. If we don't have robust um, support, if, we, if there is more philanthropic fatigue over the years and everyone's dollars are being disseminated in different ways, we have to continue to advocate for the arts and the leadership 
um, of the arts in a more inclusive way. So that was already endemic to what we were experiencing. And in particularly the theater now is going through a wave of leadership transition right now. And that was happening right before 2020 happened. And supporting that and sustaining that change actually requires investment. And anyone who thinks it does not is, is kidding themselves, right? We have to continue to infuse you know, our, our dollars, our resources into the arts in the same way we've invested in the tech sector. No one is telling those folks to pull back and be less innovative, right? It shouldn't be any different from the arts. And so we are, we are uh, experiencing this condition of scarcity right now, before and going forward, that I think we just have to uh, get rid of. Uh, in order for the arts to be more sustainable, we have to actually change our own narrative and we've needed help for years. Um, I, I think the sustainability crisis was one of my, my um, parts of my master's thesis, coming in as a very new and emerging artist saying that there is a problem in this industry. There's no way this is sustainable. And so now we're staring at it in the face and I hope we can actually find ways um, to get us out of this together in a more collective way. And I would just, to piggyback on Kelvin's brilliant words, there is no path forward without increased institutional support. Government, foundations, corporations, this amazing level of art that we are still creating under these circumstances, it, can, it is impossible for it to continue. My organization is now 95% funded by individuals, and there is absolutely unsustainable. I just want to point out we have th you know three very different kinds of organizations represented here from different disciplines different sizes from small to very large and labor here at the table and while they each of these art forms is so unique and different and the challenges are different at different scales there are some commonalities that we're hearing that are really interesting i think to sort of tease out of the conversation um, and, and in particular, I'm hearing the need for institutional support across the board with these structures. If we want to have the kind of art that can be free of the commercial pressures of the commercial marketplace, because that's what we're talking about here. Um, so I'm just curious if any of you have, as we're, as we're looking at those challenges, are there any practices so far that you can talk about that you've taken on uh, in your organizations that have been successful in moving forward, innovating, moving this conversation, and finding new ways of working in your communities? I mean, I can jump in. So, you know, what I find astonishing, I talked about specific funding challenges in Austin, but the expense of what we're all doing has grown so significantly that there is no revenue mix anywhere that is, that is keeping up. And so there is less and less performances, certainly in theater, absolutely in opera. And yet, I have never, in the 22 years that I have been working as an opera administrator, I have never seen a higher demand or a higher enthusiasm for opera. We just did um, Cruzar Mariachi Opera, which was the highest selling February show we've done in 15 years. My production of Carmen that's coming up is selling at triple the rate of our highest pre-pandemic selling show, which was La Boheme. We will sell 75% more tickets and revenue to Carmen than to La Boheme pre-pandemic. And so I think a lot of that is years and years of work um, to better reflect and partner with our community in Austin, which in 20 years will be a majority Latinx, Hispanic. Um, and our organization has changed over the past decade um, to, to really reflect that. A third of my staff are bilingual. Everything we do is in Spanish and English, everything that we publish. 25% of my staff um, are Mexican American. We are the only opera company that has a curator for Hispanic and Latinx repertoire. Our largest gift came two years ago, 3.3 million to endow Spanish language programming. I could go on and on about the investments we've made, but here's what's really astonishing to me. So we just did Cruzar. This is an opera about um, a deadly border crossing, a family, a Mexican immigrant family that's torn about, torn apart by a deadly border crossing. And in our post-performance audience surveys, we received the highest net promoter scores in our entire company history, so the highest enthusiasm rating we've ever received. Our white audiences rated us only slightly above our Latinx audiences, which was 25% of our total audience. And so we, we did an opera in Texas with a literal modern day representation of the border wall on our stage. And the entire political spectrum of my audience, which goes all the way um, to, to patrons who I've heard chanting, build that wall in other circumstances, that entire audience, and this is just weeks after our governor signed SB4 into law, 
wept together at the humanity of this woman dying in front of a border wall and stage. And that is what art is supposed to do, but it still feels astonishing to me that in this day and age um, that that is happening. And this type of art is needed more than ever. I think that's why so many of us keep you're still working. We're still doing our jobs <laughs> and still trying to push this forward. Yeah, I would say that my answer to this question is it's not something new, but continue to produce great art. I mean, I feel like that has to be the basics of bringing people back into an environment where we were separated for so long to actually give them reason to be joyous, to celebrate, to, to actually delight in the art of convening again. I think that is something we've had to invest in and make sure is part of our plan and part of our patron experience because we want audiences to return. And so luckily at the American Repertory Theater, audiences have been coming back. We had one of the highest grossing, if not the highest grossing season of our history last year with four titles. Right, so it's one of these things that we've had to engage in dynamic ticket pricing, uh, because again, it feels like the theater is the place where people promote scarcity, where we do have an audience that is willing to pay more, that is willing to actually give uh, and, and be a part of a donor community and donor base that is supporting great art. And I think that has to be part of the things that we have to lean back into, is leaning into our mission and making that as enticing as everything else that we're competing with right now, right? We're one of the last bastions where people can actually unplug and connect in real time. We can have critical discourse in the theater about the art, and that is where theater is thriving, and it still has the capacity to help solve some of what we were talking about, which were some of the world's problems, right? And we can do it through art. We can continue to be a community forum. We're having to pivot so much about how we are engaging with our community because we want folks to benefit from the art, but also share the art with communities that have been underrepresented, underserved by our markets. And it's something that we have to continue to invest in and find donors who want to help support that because we can't sell our way out of this problem, right? We are not a commercial entity for a reason. So we have to continue to solicit partners in a, in a really aggressive way. Uh, to piggyback what Annie was talking about is a social justice issue. Uh, one thing that we've been doing is creating new work to share Chinese American stories and address social justice issues. Because I feel like often people exoticize Chinese dance and they associate it uh, with a faraway place and time. And so I wanna help people view Chinese dance in the context of present day American society. Um, so in this process, we partnered with other disciplines so, such as a multicultural chorus and a hip hop crew so that we can share a message of cross-cultural solidarity. So to give an example, in 2023, we made a piece called uh, We Belong Here, Rising Against Asian Hate which was inspired not only by the recent Stop Asian Hate movement, but also a historical event that most people didn't know about, including our own dancers who are mostly Chinese American. Um, because Chinese, uh, Chinese and Chinese American history isn't really taught in schools, just like Chinese dance isn't really taught in dance schools. Um, so after the 1982 murder of Vincent Chin, which had an uh, unjust verdict, there was an Asian American movement that was much like the one that we all saw during the pandemic. Uh, which brought together Asian Americans from all walks of life and also the NAACP and local churches and synagogues and many other groups. So we partnered with the Multicultural Chorus and they sang an Irish blessing, You Do Not Walk Alone, uh, to share a message of solidarity. And we also showcased artwork by Amanda Pongparipakia, who's a child of Thai and Indonesian immigrants. Some of you may know her, I think she's spoken here at the NEA. Fun fact, she's actually a former Atlanta Chinese Dance Company dancer. Um, yeah, and it, um, we've also had the opportunity to set that work on high school and college dance programs. As I mentioned before, um, most people are not getting Chinese dance education. And so at a young age, when they're developing tastes for, for dance, they're, you know, they're mostly being fed like Western aesthetics. So I think it's really important for them to have the opportunity to learn and perform uh, marginalized art forms like Chinese dance. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight is we've been uh, trying to bring Chinese dance into small towns. So um, as limited exposure as we have in, um, in Atlanta to Chinese dance and culture, like in small towns in Georgia, it's like even worse. Like most of the time when we go there, there's like barely any Asian faces. Um, like for example, we went to like elementary schools in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district and the kids like literally like greet us with ching chong slurs, which is like kind of crazy, like in this time that that's still happening. Um, but for, for us, I mean, I think, I imagine they're, they're, they must be learning it from their parents who are probably getting it from the China bashing in the news. So beyond dance, I hope it's like our performance is just a way for them to just meet a Chinese person in real life and, and have a positive memory from it. So, yeah. I'd like to just get the advocacy uh, issue is, is 
critical. And one of the things that's been happening with the arts and entertainment unions through the Department of Professional Employees, which is affiliated with the AFL-CIO, is we've been working collectively for the last number of years in a way that is um, quite inspiring. Uh, it's a wide range of unions. I think there's some 18 of us. But to try to understand how we can collectively uh, become a force for advocacy. I think, to Kelvin, to your point about the growing professionalism, we want to sustain that professionalism. We want people to be able to have a life in the arts, to have a career in the arts. And so how can the unions uh, be, be part of the solution in advocating for funding? Because sustainable support is critical uh, to the infrastructure so that we can sustain these jobs and really, um, really, really flourish. I think um, one of the things that we've been successful at doing, this is true absolutely at SDC, is working to close the wage gap, that unions can be a real force for that, both in working with employers so that employers understand what that wage gap is. I think sometimes we don't think of that in the arts, uh, in the way uh, we maybe do in other sec sec sectors, um, but we've been very good uh, uh, about um, putting the right kinds of pressures on employers to consider those, um, particularly as they pay over scale, which is a longer conversation. Um, I'm also really excited about our work with employers around capture and distribution of live work. A lot of uh, the unions came forward during the pandemic to find new ways to address and keep audiences engaged. And many of us have agreed to continue some of those practices. At SDC, we have been working with employers to make sure we understand where that's going, because it does seem to be a new uh, way of reaching and sustaining audiences. But how can the folks that put that work together um, uh, be included in success when that happens? Um, and how can we, most importantly for directors and choreographers, be really engaged as creatives in what that work is when it's captured? It's a new form in some ways. So there are a number of uh, places, and of course the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities is working to uh, put together a, an agenda of activities that will also, um, I think, make a real difference with policy uh, in the future. So. Anyone have the last word here in our last minute here? <laughs> Support the arts, please, as fast as you can and, and forever. But um, thank you so much for having this. This has been a real honor and privilege. Well, I knew this conversation would go way too fast, and there's so much more to talk about, so I'll invite us all to continue the conversation in this room and out there in, in the world as we move forward to a better and stronger field. But thank you all to this extraordinary panel for this conversation. Microphone, is my microphone back? Okay, now we've got a treat for you. So where would our field be without the vision and voice of the actual artists who speak their truth, who illuminate what ails us and what inspires us and point the way forward? Our next uh, guest tonight, this afternoon, really embodies the spirit of one of my favorite poems by Mary Oliver, which is called Rules for Living. It's just three lines. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So please join me in welcoming renowned producing playwright and citizen Arna artist Annalisa Diaz, who will share her piece, Decomposition Instead of Collapse, Dear Theater, Be Like Soil. Thank you, everybody. Um, before I begin, I do want to give a quick shout out to Stephanie Ibarra, Regina Victor, and Lauren Halverson, who helped um, encourage me to write this piece and to publish it and get it disseminated. One of the biggest obstacles to systemic change is the unwillingness to move beyond the current paradigm that we inhabit. We won't be able to identify solutions or viability and scalability of those solutions until we move beyond an economic paradigm driven by scarcity. This essay is for those interested in using the imagination to push past the limitations of our current social and economic containers. I'll start with a quote. At the time, all we knew was the story had run out, all the stories, of staying young to cheat death, of thinking young people wouldn't die, of immortality via making a difference, of genetic imprint as stability. 
of stacking money and etching names on buildings. People, people used to do those things before. Not to mention, they would not mention death and would hide the dying away and strive to protect the eyes of the children who already knew everything. At some point, all the dead being here anyway, and all of us being here obviously doomed, we let go of that particular game and started breathing and saw our hands. We let go. I felt like I could fly. That's from Alexis Pauling Gum's M Archive. I encourage you all to read it. Beginning, middle. There are lists going around. Every day, another closing, another staff shattered. People ask, is anyone keeping track of the losses? Who's watching? Do you see the magnitude of the disaster? An archival impulse, make a list order the chaos, name the emergency. Do you realize we've become conservation biologists? Critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, least concern. Some are reeling in shock. Some are wringing their hands. Others have seen it coming for decades. Their hearts are still breaking. Did they truly understand the scale? Rooms full of dedicated leaders saying over and over, rock bottom, while they compare deficit budgets and whisper incantations like implosion and existential threat. Beginning, middle. I need a different metaphor than rock bottom. I'm exhausted by the stories of scarcity, threats, and imminent collapse. I'm a playwright and dramaturg, so what I know is we have a narrative problem. It's the same narrative problem we have in climate organizing. We keep spell casting about all we're losing and describing the immensity of the damage. So it becomes too overwhelming to, build, to imagine building something different. It becomes impossible to build the political will to act. I long for a different dramaturgy. In Western dramaturgies, endings are final. In a capitalist narrative of constant growth and perpetual sustainability, endings are tragic. No wonder people are panicking. No wonder it hurts so much. We've been telling ourselves that endings equal failures, institutional and worse, personal. What if instead of dramaturgies of collapse, we looked to the earth and learned from natural processes of decomposition? Decomposition is gruesome. Pieces of an organism get pulled apart. Decomposition is intimate. Decomposers digest the dead. Decomposition creates new worlds. Nutrients recycle and release back into the ecological system. A dramaturgy of decomposition is a tender invitation beyond loss toward remembering our interconnected futures. Can we be like mycelium? Can we be like soil? What might we recompose with the nutrients being released into the system right now? What if this moment, painful and raw though it be, and grief does have its place, is not just the ending of a world, but the beginning of something new? What if instead of at rock bottom, we're at the dawn of an arts ecology that's more healthy, more loving, more free? I long for a theater that turns its gaze downward toward the land, outward to the water, and upward to the sky. I long for a theater that earnestly listens for the lessons the earth has to teach us. This is how we'll remember that like mycelia, like the soil, like interconnected forests and seas, we have always belonged to one another. This is how we'll find unexpected pathways. This is how we'll reconstitute the world. And let us keep our grief in perspective. We're in the midst of an actual global extinction crisis driven by colonial capitalist enclosure of wealth and an ideological worldview that positions whole peoples and geographies as sacrifice zones. Institutions programming fewer shows or shutting down altogether isn't the root problem. Beginning, middle, and then. 
In a recent conversation, someone told me, the field is ablaze, it's up to us to put on our vests and be firefighters. Someone else said, these institutions want to be told what to do, they're looking for someone to save them. But we don't need saviors. So many leaders of color have been appointed in the last five to seven years and expected to be singular saviors of institutions that enclosed wealth for decades. So many more are about to be appointed. This again is a narrative problem. We know what happens to saviors. They're designed to be crucified. No, we don't need saviors. We need world builders. And thank goddess, our field is rife with them. I see world builders making bold choices to leave behind buildings. I see world builders mapping and pooling collective resources. I see world builders reinvesting in local ecologies. We need mycelial networks and compost and time. Where do you see them? What you pay attention to grows. People keep talking as though there's a single solution to the business model, as though it was ever singular. Like whoever can crack the code first will win. What game are they playing? There won't be a single magic remedy for the whole field. Valorizing the monoculture of lort institutional theaters is what got us here. We need to build a solidarity economy of ideas. Not every idea will work for everyone. Not one intervention, but many interventions. Not one vision, but many visions. To change everything, we need everyone. In the spirit of interdependence of living systems, I have invited locutors, interlocutors to continue world building alongside me. Their responses will come soon. In the meantime, let us revere biodiversity of form, of aesthetic, of story. Let us celebrate bioregionalism. Think global, act local. And let us be like nutrient-rich soil, regenerative and moving always towards new life. Thank you. Wow, I think that's what everybody uh, that's in the room and hopefully out there is probably feeling. Um, thank you so much, Annalisa. That was just incredibly inspiring. Um, I am the NEA's dance director, Sarah Nash, and I am really, really honored um, to be sitting down with all of you today um, and to moderate our next panel, which is where do we go from here, right? Where do we go from here? How can we be like soil? Um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation and really enjoying the conversations leading up to this with you all. And, um, and really hope to be able to draw on the expertise of our panelists, um, but maybe I should call them world builders, um, who all lead and work really passionately on behalf of their performing arts organizations, on behalf of artists, um, and on behalf of our communities. So our goal today uh, with this conversation is for each of you to share uh, your perspectives about how we can strengthen the performing arts ecosystem um, and to imagine, maybe conjure, as Camilla said, uh, what the future of live performance can be. Um, so thank you all so much for being with us today. And to begin, I will introduce uh, Blake Anthony Johnson, president and CEO of Chicago Sinfonietta, Christy Bolingbroke, executive artistic director, the National Center for Choreography, Akron, and Leslie Ishii, artistic director of Perseverance Theater in Juneau, Alaska. Um, let's see. So, uh, Blake, Anthony, you're in the hot seat. I'm going to start with you. Um, I would love for you to tell me 
how you think the performing arts are contributing to the health and the well-being of all of our communities um, and how they can drive equitable outcomes. I don't have my cello on stage, so to go after a performer, I'm like, man, here we go. Okay. Um, I, I'm really going to give hopefully a few like tangible examples, but really within the context of breaking the fourth wall, or be maybe a better way of saying it, like redefining what breaking the fourth wall is. So I think we talk a lot about what art happens on stage, but really like how it interacts in the communities in which we reside. So I'm the president and CEO for Chicago Sinfonietta Orchestra. Its mission is championing equity, diversity, and inclusion, and belonging by creating community through both symphonic experiences. As a cultural institution, we really feel like we have a direct role in using, um, or I guess presenting art for art's sake without defense, but also having art be a very effective tool at addressing the social determinants of health. And so a, a good example of that is our pay what you can ticketing model. So Chicago Sinfonietta, essentially at its core with this pay what you can, it basically says like we wanna promote accessibility by making sure we address um, uh, economic um, inequities. And so this program um, started in Chicago, but is now um, used nationally. So you can use this in California, they use it in Texas, they use it in New York. And it basically, it eliminates um, economic segmentation between those who go to the concert hall and who don't, but also eliminates economic segmentation within the concert hall itself. So whether you spent $200 or $2 in a concert hall, you don't know. Um, and there's been a couple of learned outcomes from this. One is this idea of, I think we have a lot of assumptions of who would use the program. Mm -hmm. One of the largest actually populations who use the program are households who have kinship care. So there's a very large population that keeps growing in our country of grandparents raising grandchildren, but a lot of them have fixed income. And they want to expose their dependents to arts and culture. They want to have them exposed to community. And things like the pay what you can ticketing model actually allows that. Uh, another just takeaway that has been really interesting as I look at our concert hall, but also other orchestras around the country who have adopted it, is it allows us um, to reduce the barrier of entry, not just for individuals to enjoy the art form, but also it reduces the barrier of entry for us to actually present our strongest value proposition statement. And what I mean by that is they come into the concert hall, but they actually get to see Yes, we are providing arts for art's sake, but we are also doing things in the community that address social determinants of health and quality of life for everyone. So they get to learn about our education programs. They get to learn about our historically black colleges and university tours. They get to learn about, just in firsthand experience, what community and fellowship actually looks like. And so one of the most defining moments I've had with this particular work is during my tenure in Louisville. Um, Louisville has a CEO health council um, Louisville is one of the largest concentrations of aging healthcare headquarter operations, and they were crazy enough and maybe innovative enough to invite someone like me at the table and say, like, what can we do that's better? And one of the outcomes of this was creative aging, this idea of, like, lifelong learning um, does not need to be siloed, and by kind of um, marrying healthcare with creative industries, um, is created creative aging and redefining the workforce. And then kind of bringing it back to Chicago, um, as another example, I have the privilege of serving as the chairman for the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, um, Cultural Advisory Council for the city of Chicago, long title, I know. Um, and one of our programs that we released in the 2023 report is a partnership between the Chicago um, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, the Chicago Department of Public Health, and also the sister um, the colleges, city colleges of Chicago. And essentially what this is, is the Chicago Arts and Health um, program for creative workers. This idea of expanding what it means to have a viable career in creative industries by actually training and employing them in healthcare as well. And so I think hopefully there's like maybe three tangibles to the question, but also I think in alignment what so much of you guys were talking about in the summit in January, this idea of um, how does art for art's sake, again, with no defense, but also how does it lead to more equitable outcomes in community? Thank you so much. Christy, over to you. 
Okay, yes, I, I, I'll address the question. I'm so excited to get to the work. I'm so inspired by what we've heard so far today. Um, I want to share that for NCC Akron, uh, we don't have audiences. We are dedicated to being a research and development space to advance the art form of dance and as a national center advocate for it and the creative process as a more essential part of culture in this country. So I very much relate to what Annalisa shared as we have a narrative problem. Um, because when I first got to Akron, uh, whose bread and butter, its economy, had really thrived on polymer sciences for over 100 years until the last factory closed in the 80s. Um, but your tires used to get made in Akron. And I had to shift the narrative when I first got there and people said, oh, you're making dance. When can I come to your show? Yep, I'm not going to invite you to a show. What, what do you do? And so then I started to share, and I really appreciated what the Surgeon General said last time, that artists and scientists are very similar. And so I would say a choreographer going into the studio is the same as a scientist going into a lab. We have a hypothesis. We think we're going to make a 50-minute dance. We think it's going to premiere on this day and time. Things happen, you know, especially working with humans or otherwise. Um, it never goes as you thought it was going to be planned. And I think that for a long time, the assumptions have been that art making is a sort of formula. And you just like have the music and you add the dancers and they just make that. And so we can reveal more of our process. And I might offer today that a reframe for artists is that we're civic problem solvers. We're not just making art as an escapist. I will share from a personal experience in Akron then, uh, NCC Akron has been able to be a part of a national cohort called Reimagining the Civic Commons. And this is something that is about designing public spaces so that they are more equitable, environmentally conscious, for, regardless of background. Why is a choreography center a part of that? we get to be along for the ride on research. And when we hear from other cities, Akron is in it, it shows up differently in how it manifests in Detroit or Memphis or Chicago. And I am always equally surprised and not at all surprised when I hear other participants talk about the most powerful and impactful program that maybe they tried in the last year, usually involved dance. It is hustle lessons in a dilapidated <laughs> parking lot in a neighborhood that no one seems to care about. And that's because those of us in the performing arts know that people feel better when they can be together, when you can move together. If you wanna feel like you belong, keeping in line with the traffic of, of line dancing is the easiest way that you know whether you belong or not. And so those are small ways that the arts, particularly the live performing arts, can contribute to the health of a community and its ecosystem. The balance or difference I would offer is we're not just a value add. We should be able to drive alongside those residents from the center of the planning and the conversation. Thanks. I love that. Civic problem solvers. Um, Leslie, I'd love to hear um, your perspective and what you want to share. Sure, thank you. Well, first, um, this is how I always start. I just encourage us to look around, just take each other in. This is our community. And today, thank you, we get to join your community and just breathe and notice. Yeah. My deepest gratitude to you, Chair Jackson. I've known you for some time. You've been a true inspiration. And to your staff, they're incredible. <laughs> and to the National Council, thank you. And my esteemed colleagues here today, I've learned so much already. I'm so inspired by you all. So it's truly an honor to be here. So thank you, and thank you for those tuning in as well. Um, oh, pardon me, that was my cane. Um, I also want to take a moment to pay homage to a colleague that was my mentor and a, and a National Council on the Arts member, Diane Rodriguez. She was a tremendous mentor to many of us, really held the door open for so many of us, and I believe I'm sitting here today because of that. 
And because of her, I'm inspired my entire career now to look at the health and wellness of our communities, to look at weathering that has um, plagued many BIPOC communities, uh, navigating systemic oppression, but really all of us, right? And so I carry that with me into every process to changing structures where we can. And systemic oppression will have us target people and blame people. But Bill Roush taught me at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, it actually might be the structure. Let's change the structure and the processes. So with that, that's really been what I've been able to do to support Perseverance Theater in this new chapter. And I currently sit on the board of the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists. And we have a conference festival coming up in May that will center Kanaka Maole, Pacific Islanders and Asians throughout the Hawaiian um, archipelago and the Oceana. So uh, I've learned a tremendous amount in thinking this way. And with that, I wanna lift up it kind of ties us back to the original panel, the first panel, that through the COVID pandemic, I learned that black and brown people's life expectancy was shortened by over four years. And the white community as well, by less than that, by about 1.2 years. It's been rising since, gratefully. But now, as I think about processes and health and wellness, I think about how can we extend our lives? How are we contributing to our communities? Because you know in the past it's been a very patriarchal model where we put up a cute or sexy ad and expect everybody to come. And many times they did. You know, it kind of worked for a while. But that was limiting on which audiences felt welcome, which patrons, which communities felt welcome. So now at Perseverance, we actually listen in community. We do listening tours. And we also choose our season that way. I was chatting with Kelvin Dinkins that um, it kind of challenges the managing side, like when can we ratify the budget? Because <laughs> we're decolonizing time to really listen in community and choose a season that will serve the community and lift up the conversations they would like to have and what we need to have. So that's one way we're working around health and wellness. Also, I'll just share a few examples. Um, and I, I want to give credit to the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists uh, with an ad hoc committee from the Latinx Theater Commons, Black Theater Commons, and Native Indigenous Leaders conducted a COVID impact survey that brought forth devastating anecdotal research. And then with the scientific, again, combining the science with the scientific um, health research, we were able to have a program called Healing Over Hate when anti-Asian hate and violence and anti-blackness was spiking. Um, over 100%, no, actually 400%. So um, we were able to offer uh, de-escalation, upstander, bystander training, and self-defense training. And we continue that now in Alaska with arts and culture leaders. We talk about creating safe and brave spaces, and it's really just talk. So now we're implementing training to actually support our artists, including guest artists, and our arts and culture leaders who welcome our communities into our spaces to have that training, those tools, those resources, in order to actually, in community as well, de-escalate and support safe and brave bravery. And I also go by the clinket saying, Igoi Juan, which is be strong and have courage. So we're moving in those ways. I'll also share that I'm greatly inspired by my Japanese American elders, uh, Dr. Tatsuki Ina and Dr. Joe Okamoto, who were children in the US concentration camps during World War II, survivors. I'm Yonsei, fourth generation, a descendant of survivors and non-survivors. And um, they have helped me learn and we practice now in our community healing circles to heal from historical trauma, but also what we have to call contemporary trauma. So we practice that in our, also in our processes and our structural changes uh, throughout our theater making. And um, it's what Dr. Uh, Satsuki Ina says is healing justice. 
So healing justice along with equity, diversity, inclusion, and access is really part of decolonizing and re-indigenizing at Perseverance Theater. And I bring that to every space that I come to. With that too, informed by my own um, you know, legacy in the Japanese community, because during the time of settlement, when they were finally released from camp and the West Coast finally reopened, um, they could come back and resettle on the West Coast. For my family, resettlement meant food insecurity, houselessness. So my parents actually dedicated their lives to meal programs. So I grew up in kitchens serving the community and how can we create dignity for those who are more vulnerable in our communities? That comes first for me. So now in our arts education processes, in our rehearsal processes, and with our crews and staff, we offer meals. Mm -hmm. So that every child and their parents or guardians that want to come, their aunties, can, can be in community and have a hot meal. And that way everyone has a hot meal and those who might be more vulnerable can participate with dignity and enjoy the program and benefit, hopefully, from our programs. Uh, we also make sure now that our arts education faculty is primarily BIPOC faculty, because I've learned from the Juno, um, at City and Borough of Juno's uh, education programs, they rarely see a teacher of color, so uh, a teacher of the global majority. So uh, we now offer that faculty so that uh, our students, our campers, summer campers can come and have that influence. And those programs are run from, based on my influence and my inspirations from one of my mentors um, that was also a survivor of camp and a tremendous leader and coalition builder with the black power movement, Yuri Kochiyama. And she taught me uh, liberation theory. So liberation theory, coalition building, solidarity building is at the forefront of every process. And uh, that is helping us to build community in Alaska. The last thing I'll mention, and this really lifts up the NEA summit. Thank you so much for that. It was so affirming. In Alaska, murdered and missing indigenous women and people's issues, we have the highest percentage in our state. That's a rabbit hole I won't go down now, but I'll just say that we are also providing and working with the Central Council of Clinkett and Haida Indian Tribes Association to offer stalker training to our arts and culture leaders and any citizens that would like to join us, along with the de-escalation of standard bystander training so that we, again, can continue to build a safer, braver community and ecosystem. One of the other main um, challenges is suicide and so uh, we have been able to pivot during COVID to create a digital programming of a play that used to tour throughout the villages called The Winter Bear. And it's based on an elder, uh, Cindy, Sydney, Koya, uh, Sid, sorry, Sydney Huntington, who's Koyakon, Athabaskan. And um, this play is written by Anne Hanley, who had permissions from Sydney to offer this play. And he dedicated his life because of his own struggles with suicide to suicide prevention. So, um, and we create arts education uh, materials that go with that absolutely in um, collaboration and with permissions from the Khan communities and mental health organizations. So I'll, I'll close with that, that we've been able to really build and support organizing of communities around these vital issues. And the NEA summit was so affirming to learn so much and from Surgeon Gen General uh, Murthy who really affirmed the practices that we're offering and the way we go forward in our community. Thank you so much for all of that, Leslie. Um, I, I think some of the things that I'm hearing all of you describe, you know, as we're talking about the role of the performing arts, and you all are really describing um, performing arts organizations and practices, artistic process, um, in relation to your communities that people might not traditionally think about when they think about the arts uh, and the performing arts and they think of a stage, right? But all of these artistic practices um, and where the arts are showing up and the role that artists can play and performing arts can play in bringing, um, you know, intergenerational families together and in just lifelong learning. Um, and I'm, I'm finding all of that really inspiring. Um, and I, I know we don't have too much uh, 
much time left with our conversation before we move to the next part. But Leslie, I would like to start with you and just ask you to share, you know, where you see the future of live performance moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, I see it as extremely bright. We have a bright future, especially if we decolonize and we re-indigenize. I can share with you just briefly too, as I want to be conscious of time, that as I support the revitalization of arts and culture, language, ways of life of the Tlingit, Haida, Shimshin, and all Alaska Natives and Native Indigenous peoples throughout, especially uh, Turtle Island, um, including Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico, um, and, and colleagues who are all working in the arts uh, with their with their own processes, you know, and projects. Um, Y'all. I feel more Japanese than I have ever felt in my life. <laughs> Camp really took away our art and culture, our language, and I've been able to feel the true collective liberation of getting back to root cause and healing from colonialism, the white supremacy that intertwined and developed with the capitalism that was referred to, thank you, Annalise. That is so critical. Decolonize time. Get rid of urgency. Do you know, there's no competition. As Annalise pointed out, it's be like soil. Hike. Oh, we have so many trails to hike, y'all. And y'all got to come to Alaska. You will reclaim your relationship to the land. You must come and see the vast mountains where it comes right to the water. And if that doesn't ins inspire your imagination, and your creativity in whatever field, I don't know what will, but I invite you all to come and visit. It has really supported my own healing of historical and contemporary trauma. And if you need to more, know more details about how to decolonize, start with a gift. A gift giving in many of our cultures opens the reciprocity process. It appreciates who you're visiting with and listen. And don't come to get Come to be relational first. We must move from transactional to relational. Mm -hmm. Transactions are necessary, we know that, but we must reinvest in our relationship building. And I just know I was called to this position because of my family and how they had to resettle and the activism that has ensued since. I appreciated those who mentioned the border. Uh, Japanese Americans are actively working in coalition with border and detention because that's exactly what happened to us in mass incarceration. So I'll just share that we're community organizers. We're artists who organize community and build community. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to invest in that yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Christy. Uh, variations on a theme, um, <laughs> perhaps. And, and what I hear also in, inside of this, uh, I'll try to to make some connections, because it's not new information, but how we continue to hear about it. Um, one of the initiatives that NCC Akron has been doing, and we prototyped it before COVID, and then we're very grateful to lead support from the Mellon Foundation to really run with it, is we've built out a think tank of 22 creative administrative research teams. What is creative administrative research? It is based on the premise that there isn't one way of making art, so there shouldn't be just one way of doing arts administration. And a big part of that work has been about empowering the artists to own. They know how to make dance. They don't question themselves. Honor those artistic practices in the studio and find ways to also use them in your administrative work. I've worked with some artists as part of this think tank who have had companies for 20, 30 years, and they're like, I guess I should get to board development. Really? You know, so a lot of it is about letting go of the shoulds, of the ideas, of the one way of doing things. And, and I want to also offer, because sustainability has been brought up a lot, scarcity has been brought up a lot. Scarcity, the, the opposite of that, at NCC Akron, we work on practicing abundance. And it is a practice because the world will continue to come at you and, and it's easy to slip down that slope. And so when we then hear about, oh, well, such and such venue is only going to do three productions this year instead of four, I want to offer that that's not a loss. 
that is a practice of abundance because they may need more time and space to decolonize time. It's going to take more energy and effort to move through there. And it's us continuing to list, listen to the artists to say to their institutional partners, this is how we want to work. But I think it's going to be our institutional partners who are going to resist that way of changing for so long because they're upholding a different definition of success. That, to Laura's point, I love that you brought up a study from 1991 because when I entered the field two decades ago and I had some mentors who said, oh, we've been asking these questions forever, then maybe they're not the right questions. Instead of seeking the same answers, we need to stay curious and ask different questions to find our way how to navigate towards that brighter future. And finally, specific to dance, I'll just share dance and the performing arts. We specialize in ephemerality. You can't hold it the way you can a subject or a sculpture or a piece of you know, visual art in a museum. Why wouldn't we work towards building structures that enable to celebrate the ephemerality instead of trying to hold us into containers. Thank you all. And to give the last word, Blake Anthony, where do you see the life, the future, you know, sure. of life performing um, arts? I'm going to be very quick here in the sense of this quote, this idea of for a star to be born, there's one thing that must happen a gaseous nebula must collapse. So collapse, crumble. This isn't your destruction, it's your birth. And I think mm. as we look at this breaking point in terms of what arts and cultural institutions need to be, it will look like it's a destruction. It will look like we're losing, but I can assure you, at least in my own experience, kind of traveling and seeing a lot of my colleagues in the work that they're doing, it's, it's really not. You know, call and response is one of the oldest traditions that we have in this art form, and we've had a lot of calls from the public, from our communities, and what they want to see. Um, but in that process, just know it's not a destruction, it's just the birth. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Thank you so much. What a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much. I wish we could keep talking. Um, but I know we're going to move on to the next part of the conversation. And I believe that Greg um, and the panelists from part one are going to join us back on stage. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. As people are getting back a seat, I think we get to invite some questions from the from our wonderful council now, and we have one right. At the, let's just jump right in. There we go. Uh, first of all, I was moved by the whole program, by the speakers who I think are doing a lot of great innovative work. And we thank you for that. I think that will help to lead the nation. And the poem as well. I thought it uh, really challenged me to think about the question of innovation and change. As a presenter myself, I present in Detroit the country's largest world music festival, the Concert of Colors. And I have been thinking, along with many of my partners, some of which are here today, about how do we change? How do we innovate in a way that takes what we do and the importance of the arts to the ground level? How do we reach diverse communities where they're at, in their neighborhoods, uh, those that can't afford, which most cannot, uh, to take part in our major institutions and the performances of those institutions. How do we change the way we sustain our work? I'll give an example. Uh, corporate funding of the arts has gone down tremendously. Uh, foundation funding at best has stayed limited. Uh, 
government funding as much as we do is also limited. So how do we change that formula and get what we do to the street level? Mm -hmm. Because that's where the real change will happen. Mm -hmm. And the ideas and the art that we bring with those ideas can change the world, but we have to change in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested in ideas that you have that continue to move us in that direction. Thank you for that offering. I, I'll just say very quickly, it, it's incremental, the work that we're doing, right? No one breaks their leg is, and is then asked to run a 5K. Right. And we're in the 5K now, right? We are very much a recovering industry, right? So we have just suffered, uh, again, th these past four years and we're building back and there seems to be this urgency for us to recuperate and get back to business in a very different way without actually diagnosing the problem. And some of the root causes that have been shared by the panelists all day today. Um, and so last night at our dinner with uh, Chair Jackson, she talked about designing discomfort before you make radical change. And I think that we have been challenged as an industry with these moments of discomfort, with the retreat in funding, with, with competition in the broader sector, to actually examine and, and pivot what we are doing. There are a lot of, uh, as I said before, there are issues we could be solving as arts organizations, but I also think it accompanies relinquishing a lot of ego mm -hmm. of what we do, that we have to be the world premiere, that only one production can only premiere at one of our theaters at a time. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen uh, in the past few years this many partnerships of artistic leaders calling each other up, saying, what do you have? How do we develop it? How do we share? Right? Otherwise, when you're done with the production, it goes to the dumpster and we're done. Right? Rather than elongating the life of creative work, which is what we should be doing and sharing in broader communities um, that are not our own. So finding those opportunities for partnership and shared resources, I think, is one of the keys that I think has allowed us to be more innovative, but also to collapse some of the many things that we do. Um, you know, we all have these buildings and, and they are aging, right? Or they, they need to be renovated, why not be shared more broadly? Why not initiate these conversations in a way that f are focused on collective action? So that's one of the offerings, and I'm sure folks have other ideas, but I, I hope we can move in that direction. I will happy to riff off of that, Kelvin. Um, I love the, the point to strategic partnerships, uh, and I think that speaks to the shared economy thinking that also came up with Annalisa. Um, I think it is about the removal of ego, though, because uh, I've been thinking about Nina Simon's The Art of Relevance. Um, it's a book. Nina had written it over a decade ago. She ran the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and did radical things like move art exhibits down to the beach. Because if you know anything about Santa Cruz culture, it's a beach culture. Why would they want to go indoors? But that's not something that's being taught in museums. And so going where the people are is one thing. But the idea of relevance, when I hear statistics that audiences are down, they're not coming back for what we have to offer, when the success, sellout success of Beyonce and Taylor Swift tours shows that people are hungry for live performance experiences. But maybe we have to remove the ego that they maybe don't value what we're offering. That's not what they want. And so then it's a self-diagnosis too. And I loved hearing the Austin Opera example when you were like, yes, this resonated with them and they showed up for it. So it, it's not just the funding mechanism because that might have one sense of, you know, well, they're interested in this, so we go and seek out that community. But it's also the combination of the artistic planning, your local environment as well, like that ecosystem thinking. I would agree. Innovation requires working capital, and we've never had less working capital. And so the, the only solution is to be combining everything we are learning, everything we're doing, sharing that knowledge. Because um, I'll tell you, my audience is in Austin. It doesn't matter if a work has premiered in seven other places. When it premieres in Austin, they're like, premiere, yes, for the first. The first in Austin. And that's fine, you know, but we have, there, there is absolutely no room left in the field for ego. We have to share ideas. We have to share resources if we hope to keep growing and innovating because we don't have innovation labs in-house, you know, where we can come up with this on our own. 
But um, I mentioned earlier this idea of reducing the barrier of entry for us to present our strongest kind of value proposition. And I, I think, you know, we operate obviously under this 19th and C4 tax shelter of a 501c3 in which we pursue to public good and social good. And I think when I look at my own kind of career trajectory, I'm like within my lifetime, you know, the global majority will be the majority in this country. Within my lifetime, we will have an enormous amount of wealth transferred in the world, but 68% of that wealth is U.S. households. And so this idea of like, we have the desire to create and innovate um, and to have the rate of change within our institutions match that of what's happening outside. But I think we have to be very honest about some of the very real hurdles that we face of the structures that built the institutions themselves. And so for my students at Roosevelt University, um, even the, the evolution of unions, for instance, mm -hmm. is something that people need to fundamentally understand how they went from mutual aid societies, how they went to the National League of Musicians, why we needed to have a Negro African, uh, a Negro Association, the Jewish Association, and what it looks like to have the Na Knights of Labor versus the American Federation of Musicians, and what does their breaking point look like, and what's their role in also finding some of these solutions. So I think kind of um, getting back to the reducing barriers is really important to me. I see we have a question from Camilla, her hands raised. Absolutely. Um, thank you all. I, I love this talk and, and, and specifically around the idea around solidarity economy movement. Um, but, but my question is also about, you know, the response of, in 2020 brought, brought forth a lot of change that I've even heard, you know, on this panel. Um, specifically, like the BLM movement pushed our field into a moment under which there were bold, aggressive swings around creative decisions that were happening on stage, but also leadership transitions. Um, and now, as we've talked about the doubling structural deficit that institutions are being faced with, and I love what Annalisa said, is that you know there's so many um, leaders now who have been appointed, and specifically leaders of color in, 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 in um, broad um, um, performing arts centers um, and, and Lord Theaters, uh, and, and, and been hoisted as these moment of saviors, right? And, and I love she said the idea of saviors are designed to be crucified. How do we as a field support this moment, um, this moment that has, has, has brought forth sort of broad DEI swings, but at the same time in, in, invest in current leadership um, so that we are, we are, we're setting up not only our field, but leadership wins. And I'm just curious from the panel um, on various different modalities in which that can happen. All right, I'm gonna just say before we get responses that I'm told, even though I'm hearing Leslie in my head saying we need to decolonize time, we are actually running out of time. <laughs> So we have one or two responses, and then we're going to wrap it up and turn it back to Chair Jackson. Can I jump in here? Hello? Um, Camilla, that's a great question, and I think it's one of the big struggles we have right now is that we are opening up the field, which is long overdue, I think, as we all know, and we're opening up the field both to leaders and to workers, and yet, what is the expectation of success or being able to have a life, right? I mean, it's really, it's really a challenge. And I think as we talk about innovation and new ways of working, I think we have to keep in the center um, of the, that thought that we're talking about having people work harder for less resource with less chance of success, or we're encouraging folks into this field and yet they will find themselves in 10, 20, 30 years unable to uh, live a life. And I don't have the answer to that. I just think it's something that we lose sight of in this moment and that we wanna keep our grassroots on the groundwork happening, but we can't lose sight of the need to support the infrastructure so that leaders can succeed and so that folks can come into this work and have a life. I have a thought. Hi, this is Leslie. Um, Thank you, thank you for that. You spurred some thoughts there, Laura. Um, one of the things is building a board that supports leaders of the global majority. At Perseverance Theater, since this new chapter, we have a board that is majority women of color, and they come from different sectors. Our board president, uh, Joe Bedard, great kudos to him. He is Yupik Cree, Alaska Native, Native Indigenous, and works in the IT uh, sector and with the Sea Alaska um, uh, Regional Health Consortium. 
and then we have relationships with the chief medical officer. So we, we started to build relationships out that help with how do we increase our life expectancy? How do we create the programming? But the other thing I want to mention, too, is, and this is a bigger leap for many of us, and gratefully I was able to come with a gift, as I mentioned, and make relations and deepening trust with Alaska Native leaders and elders. Um, so our relations with Central Council of Clinkett and Haida that I mentioned, um, it means actually getting to study, look at, observe, and respect and even be in accordance and alignment with how Native Indigenous governance works. It's critical. We talk about innovation, and I'm kind of in a weird place about the word innovation and what that's meant for us. I'm not sure it's innovation. I think it might be integration. When I look at the, the learnings, we at Perseverance work with consent and permissions uh, with the Alaska Native elders and their governance, their leaders, their arts and culture, uh, culture bearers, their arts and culture leaders and artists. So they bring such knowledges, such wisdom from since time immemorial, their ways of life that are not innovative. It's integration with that historical, I mentioned trauma, but now we're moving into the healing part with the contemporary. And their newer generations are generations that are up and coming, and many of them now established, are incredible. They've been able to successfully take the traditional and integrate it into the contemporary. So I don't know if that's innovation. I think it's an integration, again, toward, of, of decolonizing towards re-indigenizing. And we're all growing and healing and finding new ways of working. And, and again, in accordance and uh, alignment with governance there. That's such a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> and thank you to our, our council for hosting us, to Chair Jackson for having this converse, inviting this conversation, and to our incredible panelists. And even though we have to cut off this public conversation, I really invite us all, both on the stage and in the audience, to continue the conversation with our panelists. We all have so much to learn from each other, but thank you again so much for hosting us today. So thank you, Greg, and thank you, Sarah. And once again, thank you to our council, to Annalisa Diaz, uh, to our presenters today. Uh, your insights are certainly helping to strengthen our sector and, and our nation every day. And thank you for encouraging us to consider other worldviews, uh, to consider multiple perspectives and different ways of seeing, knowing, and evolving. Thank you. Uh, an important component of the NEA's work is, uh, let me go back, I'm sorry. So again, uh, as we round, let's, another round of applause for our members, please, so panel members. Okay, so as the final piece of business, I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications presented and that a tally of the council members' ballots revealed that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. Thank you, council members. Um, an important component of the NEA's work is recognizing uh, select individuals who've contributed an outsized measure to the vibrancy and cultural vitality of our nation. And next month, the NEA will host a series of events in honor of this year's NEA Jazz Masters. Do we have the sizzle reel? The National Endowment for the Arts, along with the Kennedy Center, presents the 2024 NEA Jazz Masters Tribute Concert. Honoring Amina Claudine Myers, Gary Barks, Terrence Blanchard, and Willard Jenkins. A free in-person concert and streamed online at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, April 13th. Get in-person tickets or watch online. More details at kennedy-center.org or parts.gov. Uh, the NEA Jazz Masters Fellowship is the highest honor that our nation bestows on jazz artists. And each year since 1982, the program has uh, elevated into its ranks a select number of living legends who've made exceptional contributions to the advancement of jazz. 
So since the inception of the honor, the endowment has awarded 173 fellowships to jazz greats such as Regina Carter, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Donald Harrison Jr., Sonny Rollins, and Yusef Latif. This year's Jazz Masters, as I think you just heard, are saxophonist and educator Gary Bartz, trumpeter, composer, band leader, and educator Terrence Blanchard, pianist, organist, vocalist, and educator Amina Claudine Myers, and artistic director, writer, oral historian, and educator Willard Jenkins. We hope you'll join us at one or more of the following opportunities to commemorate and honor their storied careers in jazz. On Thursday, April 11th at 12.30 p.m., Willard Jenkins will participate in a discussion and Q&A at Howard University. It's titled Music Careers and Beyond the Bandstand. The public is invited to attend and observe. On Saturday, April 13th at 10.30 a.m., NPR will host a listening party in honor of the 2024 Jazz Masters at their headquarters in Washington, D.C. And this event will include conversations with the jazz masters using music from their careers to tell the stories of their lives. And this event is free and open to the public, but it requires tickets. Finally, as you saw in the video, the 2024 Jazz Masters Tribute Concert will take place on Saturday, April 13th at the Kennedy Center at 7.30 p.m. The concert will feature performances by the jazz masters and this event will be available through live stream and radio broadcast as well. For additional information regarding registration and ticketing for all of these events, please visit our website. Our next council meeting will be held in person in Ohio on June 27th and 28th, and uh, will place a special emphasis on rural communities during that meeting. I think we have a clip. Yes, our partners at the Ohio Arts Council have provided a brief clip to welcome us and showcase some of their work throughout the state. On behalf of the 11.7 million residents of the Buckeye State, we're excited and honored to welcome the National Council on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts to Ohio, the heart of it all. Ohio excels in how we invest, engage, innovate, and lead through our strong and diverse arts and cultural sector. Whether we're helping students thrive in the classroom or improving the quality of life of our veterans and seniors, we can't wait to showcase how the arts build bridges through our strategic partnerships in Ohio. The arts are always stronger when we work together. We'll see you in June. Hope that you'll follow the work of the NEA on social media and engage with the important work the agency is doing in supporting uh, organizations in your communities and nationwide. Thank you for attending. Thank you for tuning in. The 212th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Thank you.